Um, hi, my name is Tegan, and I am a third year here studying political science and broadcast journalism. Um, I am a columnist for the Daily Collegian. I help the Gender Equity Center with social media, and I'm a student advisory board for the McCourtney Institute of Democracy, which is the group that brings great speakers such as V to campus. The point of my majors is to understand political events and their depiction in the news, but despite this being my field of literal study, it can be really difficult to stay up to date with everything going on in the world. Similar to most of you, I spend many hours a day scrolling on the Doomed Clock app, and think, and it's where I get most of my news. Thanks to creators such as V bringing news to <coughs> coverage to where the young people are, we can make informed decisions. V is the creator of the Under the Desk News. Under the Desk News has three million followers on TikTok, hosting collaborations with members of Congress and visiting the White House for President, for President Joe Biden's announcement of the administration's spending package. Prior to the creation of Under the Desk News, V was the head of le women's leadership programs and impact at the James Beard Foundation. They joined TikTok during the pandemic making food videos and eventually shifted to news after January 6th. All of that being said, let's give a warm welcome to V. Thank you. Hi. Did anyone follow Under the Desk before you came here for extra credit today? Yes? Do I look as tall as you thought I would be? Because some people are like, you have legs and you're taller than I thought. Is it freaking you? Because it freaks me out. I was like, can't we just like do a rollout thing? <laughs> Unusual. Hello and welcome to Above the Desk. This is... Uh, an exciting time with lots of air out here. So yes, I'm V Spear. I am the creator and host of Under the Desk News. I also have a new podcast coming out called American Fever Dream with Betches. I don't know if you guys know the Betches Network. Phenomenal um, internet creators, the best at meme news. And so I felt like that was a good next jump for me to get into meme news. But today we're going to talk about TikTok news and politics. Are we democratizing narratives or is it a national security threat? Did you all watch the hearing of Shochu with the Congress people, all that business? Did you see me sitting behind him? So cute, right? <laughs> because what you might not know about that particular experience is that half the Congress people in that room had begged me to make TikToks with them. So when I knew that they were going to be doing this interrogation, I was like, why are you trying to ban the thing that you guys were literally tripping over yourself, like begging me to help you make TikToks? Some of you I did make TikToks with, and it helped you get elected, right? So why are we all of a sudden now like turning on TikTok? And I wanted them, I had to get up super early in the morning to get the number one ticket and make people crawl across me so that I could sit directly behind Shochu so that when they looked at him, they would have to look at me because TikTok is so much more than a platform. It's a community. And it really is about the community. And so I wanted them, when they looked at him, to see me and hold some sort of accountability. Um, this is the most egotistical day of my life, putting that together, right? Like, who am I? <laughs> and similarly, I knew folks would be watching at home, and I wanted them to know that we were in the room, because that's my promise, right? Is I'll take you behind the scenes where I get to go, you get to go. And so this is where I feel that TikTok, more than any other platform, does focus on what I've called citizen journalism, what we can think of as peer-led learning. But there have been, of course, some issues with the platform as well, and like all platforms, and even trad media, quite a bit of misinformation. So let's just take a look at new media, which is what they call what I do. I didn't know that. That was told to me in a very condescending tone by real journalists who were like, well, you're like new media. I'm like, is that bad? Like, what's bad about new media? It sounds new. That sounds exciting. Doesn't everybody want new stuff? And the answer is actually no. But in 2020, 22% of TikTok users reported getting their news from TikTok. Now, this is when I started making news TikToks. It was peak pandemic. And part of the reason that I started making them is because I really felt scared and just like annoyed every time I put on the TV. These news figures that I had really liked, up there and including even Rachel Maddow, was just bumming me out all the time. They were also home, if you recall, which really took the shine off some of these journalists who were just like sitting in their house like with pajamas on from the bottom down and like trying to talk to you. And I was like, this is not going to work. And I... You might not know this about me, but I was a UCA all-star cheerleader in high school. I am forever accused of cheerleading the news. And I felt like this is my time. The news needs a cheerleader. And it's going to be me. And so I started doing the news and just trying to tell people like what happened. Like if you've seen the show, it's like it's Monday night and here's what happened. And that's because that's what I needed. I didn't know if it existed. I didn't know that social media could be a real career. I didn't expect to be famous or break into journalism or any other thing. I was just trying to like entertain myself and kind of like find community 
through this little phone that was on the floor of my office. So back in 2020, 22% of people were, said that they were getting news from TikTok, but by 2024, it was up to 43%, which is a significant jump, especially when we know that trust in legacy media has sort of consequentially fallen. Um, Facebook is still the most popular social media platform for news consumption, with roughly three in 10 US households getting their news from the site. But that doesn't scare Congress for some reason. When the Pew Research article came out this October saying one in three people get their news on TikTok, people lost their friggin' minds. They were like, the kids are being radicalized, the world has gone to shit, who's getting their news on TikTok in between dancing videos and get ready with me's? There's gonna be all disinformation, it's Chinese propaganda, it's Russian propaganda, it's bots. It's definitely not this adorable little queer person under their desk that's trying to help people get through their day. When we look at legacy media, they have seen a similar shift. And this is what I've been the host of LA Times TikTok, if it was the host of Washington Post while Dave was out, I've worked with NBC. They constantly are so afraid of me and afraid of new media, and they're like, well, you're an interloper, and you're like trying to cut the line of journalism. I'm like, babes, I don't even know if I wanna be here, okay? I'm like a TikToker, and y'all aren't really nice to me, so I don't know if I wanna be a journalist. And for years, it was very much like, no, 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 I'm a TikToker. Legacy media has seen the same rise in digital consumption as they did before. So in fact, it's not that one in three people are getting their news from TikTok and they're not getting it from digital media. It's just the way that people are consuming news is different. And even if you look at TikToks, what's behind us on the green screen half the time? A screenshot from a legacy media reporting, right? So if we could see that space as together and amplifying the voices of professional journalists and reporters who have put their whole career into having ethics, knowing how to follow through with leads, and recognize that we're kind of like megaphones for them in many ways in the best case of scenarios, and they're seeing the same stuff. People like to get their news online. They like to control the flow of news. They like to skip a story if they don't want to hear it. We want things to be niche and curated for us. And it's the same thing that we've seen here. Now, CNN spent $300 million trying to do a streaming platform. You could give me like 100 bucks and a couple of hoodies and I could have hooked you up. Like people don't necessarily want to add another platform, right? Because at the same time, you have to pay for those. And like, now that's one more thing to add. But they're all doing TikToks. They all have big Instagram accounts. They all have huge Twitter accounts. Legacy media and new media are playing in the same world. It's just sometimes they don't want to admit that we're all in the same world and that we're all kind of in the same situation. And they've experienced growth um, during 2020 uh, and 2022. Coincides with the pandemic and with presidential election years. The news is always more interesting during an election year, right? Here's the key difference for me between traditional journalism and what we do on TikTok, and that is the personality. So you've got news personalities, and this is where I think legacy media kind of failed when they tried to jump into the system, is LA Times came to me first and were like, we, how much to buy under the desk? I was like, oh my God, please don't buy it. Like, I don't even know what I would do. And they're like, okay, you could be the host then. Like, what does that look like? How do we do it? You'll just be the personality for LA. I was like, I literally live in Rochester, New York. <laughs> like, I couldn't be less LA. I can't do that, right? Um, and they thought, well, what's so great about TikTok is the personality. They like you because you're an influencer. They like people on TikTok because they're influencers. I'm like, influencers to me are people who have something to sell you or are influencing you into a certain culture. And while there's a level of that that we do in journalism, I don't think of myself as an influencer. I don't, it doesn't rock like that exactly. So they were looking at us and they were saying like, okay, well, Washington Post has Dave. When Dave started making TikToks for the Washington Post, it was highly experimental and he was completely unsupervised. Dave, <laughs> if you look at some of the early stuff, it's wild, right? Dave is a video editor. He's an incredibly talented video editor. He's not a traditional journalist. He wasn't a reporter before he became the face of the Washington Post, which I think is really interesting, but incredible at video storytelling. You've got I Am Legally Hype. Do you guys know? Okay, so boom, here's what happened. So uh, A.B. Burns is a creator out of L.A. She's a lawyer, um, one of my very best friends, and she does all of her news reports in AAVE. So she'll be like, Pootie Scoot did whatever, and she's using like all kinds of like street language to present her news and what's going on. It's entertaining. Even if you have no idea what she's saying, you do get it at the end, and it's been interesting. So she's really powerful personality. Taylor Lorenz, 
arguably one of the most important tech journalists of this time, did not go to J school. On staff at the Washington Post does some incredible reporting, now also has a TikTok, presents herself as a personality. And then of course, like the SpongeBob fish, you know? You don't even have to be a person. And I think the SpongeBob fish does great work. I would love to know who's behind that guy, but sometimes it comes up and I'm like, you know what? This is uh, pandering to millennials at its absolute finest. Love a cartoon reference. And it's fun, and it makes you smile when you see it. Whereas when you see the news come up sometimes, I don't know if it makes you smile, it makes me kind of be like, <laughs> you know? So the legacy media was like, well, we just have to have personalities. So what we'll do is we'll get the youngest person on our team and we'll force them to be the personality. And of course that doesn't work, right? And so now what we've seen legacy media do is switch into the thing that they are really good at, which is high quality video production with voiceover. Anyone familiar with Philip DeFranco? Philly on YouTube. Philip DeFranco pioneered this idea of social media news. Uh, he has a huge account on YouTube. He now has a TikTok as well. And he uses tons of clips of just video B-roll, and then he does a voiceover over it. What's great about that is it doesn't require you to develop a personality that your brand will be built around, where if NBC puts a personality out there, now it's about that personality and not about the network or the journalists that contributed to it. And similarly, it's very stealable. Your content on social media needs to be duettable, shareable, stealable. So now, folks, you see, we'll see all this fast-moving um, footage. They'll duet it, and they'll put their own voiceover over it. It's still using NBC's content. It's still giving them a place in the ethos of what we're doing, but it's not um, stepping on toes or trying to jump in or control it or take away the fun toy. When we talk about misinformation, TikTok reported that 19.4% of search results for COVID-19 contained misinformation. And when it comes to misinformation, COVID misinformation is the one that we have the most research on, so that's what I'm using as the example here. But you can think of misinformation about anything, about war, about the election, et cetera. It's just harder to measure. At the same time, cable TV news viewers, 78% of people believed some form of misinformation about COVID-19. So for people to keep coming for TikTok and saying it's a center of misinformation because it's peer-led or because some expert hasn't put their little spin on it, 78% of people who watch cable news were believing things that weren't true, which is, you know, I think it's higher. You guys are in college, is it higher? Yeah. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that I like to try and bring up when folks are like, TikTok is bad, TikTok should be banned, TikTok is a place of misinformation. Uh, TikTok is rotting the brains of children. Now there are tactics of disinformation. I'm sorry, I've never used one of these over the ear ones. It's so, just, you can't move. Okay, tactics of disinformation that we see on TikTok the most and we have to admit because if we know them, then we can pick them out and then we won't fall victim to them are things like fear. Fear works in trad media. Fear works really good on TikTok. And fear comes in a couple different buckets for me. One is a video that starts, no one is talking about this. Girl, people are talking about it or you wouldn't know about it, right? Like, but it gets you. No one's talking about this. People seek secret knowledge. This is why they go to journalists. They want an inside scoop. They want to know it first. They want secret knowledge. There are bad actors who will present no one is talking about this and then say something that is just batshit bananas. <laughs> like, but you're already in the mindset of like, well, I should be questioning. I should be taking this in as like good faith discussion. Another way that fear is used is fear of not saying something. And we see this a lot with uh, social justice stuff. There'll be a certain thing that's happening. Let's take the killing of Masa Amini last year. And uh, some people will be talking about it. Other people maybe didn't hear about it yet. And then that person's getting dragged for not talking about Masa Amini yet. So now we've got fear, the fear of, that creators have of like not knowing what the next thing is that they should talk about. Because if they don't talk about it, people are going to think that they don't care. And we, we can't have that because our entire credibility is based on our authenticity and a lot of times our compassion. So there's this fear that governs a lot of TikTok to be first so that you're not somehow called out. Digital gaslighting. This happens a little bit more on the right wing, um, and I have, this is gonna be maybe a surprise to some people, I have a 30% conservative audience, and the number one employer of my audience is the United States Army. Right, little queer old me, just breaking the ice over there, having a good time. 
So, and I think part of that is because I do just tell you what happened, and everyone, no matter what political spectrum they come from, wants to be informed, wants to feel smart, and I'm very like, take what you heard here, plagiarize me, make it your own, go back to your com community and talk about it, like, that's okay. You guys can come in. So, digital gaslighting, something that happens a little bit more on the right, where maybe somebody came out with a story and now it's changed a little bit, instead of issuing a correction or just saying like, hey, we have new information and here's where we are now, they'll be like, no, I never, I never said that. You're wrong, that doesn't sound like something I would say. And that kind of thing not only creates distrust in your community, but it's so exhausting. It's exhausting to do that. Digital gaslighting also happens when people st stitch or duet your videos on TikTok and add context that was not in the original video, and this happens a lot, a lot of times. For me, it happens where, and I have to be careful in the way I craft a sentence, because if I can get somebody to stitch off just one little part of the sentence I said, and then be like, oh my gosh, V hates frogs. And I'm like, V never said anything about that. V said frogs are on decline, and, they're, and, and you're glad that they are, right? Like, people will take what you say and they'll stitch it. That creates a little bit of digital gaslighting, trying to make it seem like you agree with their point of view, or they're reinforcing what you said, or they're putting words in your mouth that weren't there. That's something we have to fight on social media. Flooding. This happens in trad media, this happens on social media. Something is coming out, and somebody doesn't want that to be the main story. You think about like the Friday news dump, right? So when we don't want people to know stuff, we kick it in the late issue on Friday, same thing with social media. It goes in the seven o'clock news on Friday, people are already off, they don't care. And if they hear it, they're in a mentality to be like, that sucks, I'll deal with that Monday, and then they forget. This happens on social media, when, not bots always, but sometimes bots, will try to swarm around covering something by either flooding your comments or your duets and stitches or just videos with something else that's not true about the situation or trying to create another story. So an example of this that I would say is, uh, do I wanna use this one? Okay, we'll use this one we know that there's a lot going on in the Middle East, and that is the primary thing that we're talking about at the time. Some people didn't want folks to be talking about that anymore, so they started to flood you with, well, why don't you care about the Sudan? That happened to everybody in here, I'm sure, right? I do, I care about both, but right in this exact second, I'm talking about the thing that's right in front of me, and then next I'll talk about how this is systemically an issue with imperialism or oppressor culture. But they, you'll get these bad actor people who come in and they try to make you feel like, again, you're behind, we're using fear, we're using flooding. And then all I saw for like three days was like everything about how we should boycott buying new electronics because that's actually the issue, not the Middle East, it's the electronics, right? And that's media manipulation, it happens everywhere, it happened on TikTok. Deep fakes and synthetic media. This is something that's becoming more of an issue and I think will certainly play out more on social media than in trad media because the Washington Post isn't gonna publish nude photos of Taylor Swift. But Twitter did, like, you know, AI generated fake photos. Um, there is legislation that they're trying to put together to combat AI and deep fakes. Uh, I don't know if our politicians fully understand the gravity or the way that they are working or like how this rolls out to legislate on it, but there's a lot of effort being put into this. And when it comes to synthetic media, you guys see this all the time, when it's like the Daily Courier said that Donald Trump is in fact Jesus, right? And they're like, well, my dad will send us, my own family does this, he'll be like, babes. And I'm like, Dad, that's not even a newspaper. He's like, it literally is a newspaper. I'm showing you. And we have to kind of go through, you know, is that real, is that not real? Synthetic media, problem for everyone. Conspiracy clickbait, unique to TikTok and social media. And that is people who, their goal is to be TikTok famous. Their goal is not to be a journalist or to be an educator or a community member. Their goal is likes and follows because that translates to dollars. And there's nothing that they won't do to kind of get to that like and follow equaling dollars thing. Good example of this is this week, there was a woman who went to a gay bar with her friend and her friend was a straight male. And she's like, I don't know why it's a big deal that my straight male friend came to a lesbian bar. I mean, we were just trying to be allies and then we got kicked out. Well, that makes you mad, right? 
You're like, oh, that's not fair. That's not what happened. This lady made up a crazy story. And then the more she got stitched, the more she stitched them back to say more crazy stuff. And she never cared that she was getting canceled because her likes and views were going up and up and up and up and up. A hate follow is a follow for some people. For me, it scares me. So I, I try not to do that. But for some people, it doesn't matter. And you'll see a lot of folks like that who just want to be TikTok famous and they don't understand the difference between positive and negative attention. And they will flood and fill your time and your exhaust you with their nonsense. And then bullying and abuse. This goes back to the same idea of if you're not with me, you're against me. And the tribalism of social media that can happen can happen on the outside as well. But a lot of this that we see is folks, again, deciding that someone hasn't done enough as a creator and they're going to absolutely bully and harass them to the end of the earth because they didn't do X, Y, Z thing in the way that I predicted that they would. A lot of being a creator is accepting people's projections on you and having to have enough of a center to be like, that's not true about me. That's not true about me, period. Why should I be so torn up that I can't sleep because some random person I've never met said that I was a paid shill for the DNC when I know that I'm not? I'm not, so why would I, why would I respond to it? Why would I give it credence? Why would I be upset by it? Why would I feel betrayed by it? Why am I reading the comments in this crazy person's thing and just hurting my own feelings with other people's comments that say things like, yeah, there was always something sus about them. Why am I in here? I don't belong in here. This is not a place for me, right? So you have to be careful as a creator to read your comments, read your reviews and stuff, but take them with a grain of salt and recognize that sometimes people are just talking shit about you because they don't think you're gonna see it. How many times do I talk about like Kim Kardashian? I don't expect she's gonna see it. And if she did, I'd be like, I am actually so sorry. I think you're doing really great work with the police, right? So get curious about things you see on social media, but verify everything. And that's been the ethos of Under the Desk News and why I say it's Monday night and here's what happened. I give you six or seven stories. It's always, the way I craft the sentence is enough that if you took that sentence and put it in Google, you'd get, a, you'd get some populated like articles to find so that you can go be curious, do more research, and apply it to your life. When I say something like, I'm in Rochester, New York, and I'm like, they're trying to ban trans kids in sports, right? Well, to Rochester, New York, that we have lots of trans kids that play sports, so we're like, oh, that's terrible. We know these kids. These are our neighbor's kids. In Northwest Arkansas, they may not even have seen a gay person, so their idea of a trans person is like this gross stereotype. So when I do the news, I'm like, they're trying to ban trans kids in sports, and I want you to remember that they're eight years old and the girls are taller than the boys, okay? So we're not talking about big, scary people, we're talking about little kids that you would have made fun of for being too effeminate or too masculine or whatever, like let them play their little soccer game. That's something everyone can kind of like get steady on as opposed to getting divisive on because they're scared. Now, when it comes to who gets to tell the story, I think this is where trad media and new media get in big fights. Who gets to be the storyteller? Who gets to control the narrative? Washington Post publishes 1,200 stories a day. I don't know if y'all knew that. It is an, between stories, pieces of content, pictures, tweets, all that. It's 1,200 pieces a day comes out of the Washington Post every single day. TikTok publishes 34 million videos a day, but there are billions of people on TikTok and there's like 100 people at the Washington Post trying to do this work, right? So at the Washington Post, you're getting assigned stuff that you don't wanna work on, but you have to because somebody's gotta tell the story. Whereas on TikTok, we have a little bit more of like a, if I'm not the best person for it, I'll be like, you guys should really check with like Good Morning Bad News because he's a super libertarian and he's gonna know a little bit more about what's going on with the capitalist hellscape we live in and the history of it than I do because I didn't think about that today but he will. We can trade off a little bit easier on social media with who gets to be the expert or duet people that we agree with that made a good point. Trad media doesn't have that. They have to own all their own stuff. And I think that kind of like rugged individualism of trad media doesn't translate to social media, which is more of a share economy thing. So then they get all freaked out and they're like, wait, what do I do? And this having to pick a story when you're trad media and stick to it because it's expensive was played out really well in the difference between how the day that Donald Trump got arrested went. So the first time that Donald Trump got arrested, every single major news outlet, even the small outlets, even the trades, were in Mar-a-Lago, and this was what I saw on every TV channel and in every magazine, right? This picture here of a chain link fence waiting for his plane to take off. 
girl, how long do I need to look at this for? I don't, right? So I looked at it for like a couple minutes and I was like, they are so crazy obsessed with him. And granted, there's a lot to hold accountable, but like, I don't need to know the second the plane takes off. Like, give me something else later. What, what else is going on? At that same time, I got a DM from this kid Chandler, who's in Tennessee, in Nashville, just a kid, just a person. And he was like, V, there's crazy stuff going on in the Tennessee Capitol. I'm here, do you want to FaceTime? Yeah, sure, here's my phone number, random kid. That sounds great. And we did. And it worked out because at that time, the Tennessee Three and Brother Jones were holding down the well and, and trying to speak out against uh, Speaker Sexton. And they were trying to like show that the Nashville House was trying to censor these democratically elected representatives because they didn't like what they had to say. And this was a huge deal. Nobody had this. TikTok had this. And then by the time Rachel Maddow came on, she had it too because it was feral on TikTok, not even viral. It was like every single person had this. And you could go live from the state house. Uh, I had this, uh, this gal who was a former Miss Tennessee on my podcast, Tally Bevis, and I was like, Tally, are you anyway, are you maybe by the Capitol? And she's like, yeah, there's a protest. We're going down there right now. And I'm like, okay, get on your live, right? Because the pageant girlies, who are such social justice warriors also, those girls really know a lot about civics, okay? <laughs> they all got the questions down. They're ready to go. And we were able to cover the Tennessee Three in a way that major media wasn't, and we didn't have any money. We had kids in there with their phones, and that was great. It's not going to go all the way, right? We need big papers to come in and cover the rest of it and follow it up. But like, that was a great example of a day that TikTok was the place to be for news. Another one is the creator economy, especially on TikTok, is very driven by community. And your clout on TikTok is directly related to your participation as a community member. So as much as I'm a creator, I'm also a community member. I'm in my DMs, I'm in my comments, I'm in other people's videos, I watch videos, I share videos, I meet up with people from TikTok. That's like the world that we've created and it's super important. We don't get a ton of respect, especially as TikTokers. And you could kind of hold a grudge on that and be like, well, I could just steal your girl. Like, I could be the news, I could be the actor, I could be anything. And what we decided to do, which it's odd to have a collaboration with millions of people that happens on TikTok. Because we don't talk directly, we're talking through videos that we're watching of each other's, but we're all deciding collectively that something's true. When SAG-AFTRA went on strike, we were already supporting the WGA. TikTok's a very pro-union place, very community place, right? Not a place for celebrities, not a place for trad anything. Except the trad wives are doing very well right now. Um, and I saw that SAG was going on strike, and I saw that they were going to be boycotting and not attending the movie premieres. And this was the week that Barbie came out but also the week that The Haunted Mansion came out on Disney. There was a bunch of uh, Oppenheimer, a bunch of stuff coming out, huge. And um, I knew that the studios were gonna panic because those red carpets are so important to the production of the movie. And I had a feeling that they might come to creators because we do get asked sometimes to attend a movie premiere, to do a little red carpet, to do a whatever, because they want to be on TikTok. So they get Drew Afwalo to come down, or they get uh, Reese, the camera guy, to come down, or they get whoever to come down. And I was like, Reese, they're going to ask us to fill in for these actors who are on strike. And he was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, because I've waited my whole life for a chance. And we were like, we can't do it. We can't. You have to be in solidarity, or you'll lose all your like." credibility. So I got on TikTok and I was like, hi, it's vSphere, the most trusted voice on the internet, and I have something to tell you and I just need you to believe me. You're going to start to get emails from studios asking you to attend movie premieres. And while this seems like it's going to be the greatest thing that ever happened in your whole life and they're probably going to offer you a ton of money, this is what we call expensive money. If you take it now, you will be blacklisted forever. SAG, I got to talk to Duncan, who was like their negotiator. Um, SAG is going to blacklist any creator from ever being able to join the union if they attend anything during the strike. And a lot of these creators do want to be in the industry, right? They want to be an actor or filmmaker. They want to get invited later after the strike back to stuff. And it was like a <sighs> Because the studios were offering things like $25,000 to attend the haunted what mansion premiere. 
they were offering custom clothing and wardrobe to fashion creators to attend the Barbie premiere, your own custom Barbie stuff, right? Like, these were huge temptations, and people made videos about how sad they were, and some people may have even seen this kid, Landon, who does a lot of drag stuff, really crying over saying no to Barbie because it was his dream to do this. Um, and he's like, but I got asked before the strike. And I'm like, it's not going to matter, babe. They're going to kill you if you do it. And he was like, OK. And then solidarity comes, right? Now the actors have a little bit more respect for TikTokers because we had to kind of be the olive branch people first, but it was a big deal. They were getting shout outs from major actors. SAG was shouting out different creators who were standing in solidarity. We understood that there was a power that TikTokers had and the regular people had to say to the studios like, no, we're not going to come. We're not going to talk about it then if you're going to not treat people well, except for Straw Hat Goofy. Do you guys know Straw Hat Goofy? I like him. He's a good dude. Straw Hat Goofy came out and was like, forget it. V, you don't get to tell me what to do. I was like, I'm not, I'm just warning you what's going to happen. And he's like, I'm going, I'm going to go. Why wouldn't, I've been waiting my whole life. This is like a huge bag. I'm going to go. Why wouldn't I go? It's stupid to not go. They have no respect for us. I'm a TikToker, not an actor. I'm never going to join the union. And I was like, you are a movie reviewer and you have to have respect for the people who built the industry that you so love and you now benefit from. And he was like, no. So he came out and said that he was going to do it anyway and made a video about it, which I think is crazy and he immediately became the center of what would happen to somebody if they crossed this picket line, this solidarity that was created, right? And now he's since backtracked and said he was wrong and he's sorry and he didn't go, which is good. And now he's great, we love him. He's a good dude, he does really good movie reviews, he made a mistake, he got a little cocky, he learned. But this, do you think that, like, this wouldn't happen anywhere else. This is like a unique, weird, little, cool TikTok community thing where we like took down a movie studio and where videos like this came around. <laughs> Don't be a scab. I'm going to stop there for a second. Do you guys have any questions about that so far before I go into politicking? All right, we'll keep rocking. So now we have politicking on TikTok, which is the next thing that people want to complain about, that there's misinformation, disinformation, or that TikTok in particular gives the Democrats a certain lead that they either don't deserve or shouldn't have, or that's like more influencing the youth than anyone else. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, get on TikTok then. I don't know what to tell you. Turning points on TikTok, their content just doesn't do well. And they're like, we're being silenced. I'm like, your content sucks. Like, get some gay folks or creative folks on your team and it won't be so bad, you know? So there's a lot to do with, um, with TikTok being great for electability uh, and for getting your message out there. You have direct access to candidates. You can do influencer collaborations, like when Joe Biden invited a bunch of influencers to the White House for the signing of the Inflation Reduction Act. That was pretty cool. Uh, you can do live interviews. Y'all know who Marianne Williamson is? Because she is on TikTok 24 hours a day live. I don't know how she does it. She's uh, challenging Joe Biden for the presidency. She's never gotten more than 2,000 votes. But she's on TikTok live every night at 7 talking about what she cares about. And she gets thousands of people to watch her. Even if you don't agree with her, she is a household name, even though nobody's going to vote for her. There's power in that. She knows she's not going to be the president, but her talking points are getting out there. They're giving young people ideas, and those young people are writing to their senators and congressmen and telling Joe they're not going to vote for him unless he does X, Y, Z thing that Marianne Williamson promised them. You also could do press conferences. Um, if you can't get trad media to cover you, sometimes you can just go live. I had for the drop of the Epstein documents, 40,000 people watched me, and that was without a plan. 40,000 people logged in to watch me read the Epstein documents, and that was me being like, oh, they're out, live. Hey, guys, the Epstein documents just dropped, and then people come and listen, right? You could not possibly afford that with trad media. Like, you'd have to have planned it, scripted it, pitched it to them. You can't do it like that. And I don't even know if you would get that many viewers, depending, I guess depending on what network you're on or that much time to just say how you wanted to say it. Um, I covered the Thanksgiving Day Parade for NBC two years ago. And I did their TikTok live stream. And then they had the broadcast, which goes on television, and we had more people watching the TikTok live stream, and they freaked out and were like, shut it down, shut it down, they're not watching, and then they're not getting the commercials, stop talking. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> so, you know, because who doesn't want, I was just showing the balloons and being like, hey, do you want to know a fun fact about this balloon? And they're like, yeah, I do. I just want to see the balloons, man. 
and the Rockettes. So this kind of weirdness with TikTok, but politicking on TikTok also really humanizes people. Um, it gives them the chance to show a silly side of themselves, a goofy side of themselves, to connect with their audience. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Cory Booker, great guy, went to the Barbie premiere and made a Barbie TikTok during the peak of the strike. Like, bro, come on. <laughs> with, with my senator, Kirsten Gillibrand. Gotta be careful, but politicking on TikTok for being this big bad thing, Biden's approval rating is only 38.8%. If, if he was using his army of influencers that he allegedly has to poison the youth, wouldn't it be a lot higher? I don't see anybody ever riding around with like riding with Biden t-shirts or like Biden aviators or like Biden bro 24601 usernames. It doesn't work like that, right? I bet we wish it did. In fact, the most powerful person in all of politics is a member of the traditional media and the ruling elite when it comes to talent, Miss Taylor Swift, we love her. New album dropping April 13th. Um, she got 35,000 new voters registered at vote.org after just posting one story on her Instagram account. So I don't wanna hear anything about TikTok being the one to like influence the youth when it is Taylor, Allison Swift, on Instagram, which has been around you know, for decades, and which is not the choice for Gen Z uh, social media platform. Like all things, I think that social media, new media, and the news work best when they are in partnership. I work really hard on this graphic. <laughs> because it takes both. I'm a great hype man, I'm an excellent storyteller, I'm really excited about the news and I can get out here and connect with people. I'm also extremely good at distilling the news down to like 90 seconds, but we are always promoting the work of traditional journalists, of these investigative journalists, of citizen journalists. We would not have had the information about George Floyd's killing without Darnella Frazier, who was just a teenager who pulled out her phone and filmed it. She won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Citizen journalism has a point. And we're seeing so much of it play out on social media that I get why some people get nervous about it, but it's keeping us more honest, more connected, and more excited that we can participate in democracy, that we can participate in being the storyteller or controlling the narrative. So I think when we partner with news, we're doing really great things. And I also think the news feels like, at least in my experience, I keep hearing from like older people at the newspapers, well, I wanna pass the baton, but I can't, nobody's grabbing it. And I'm like, because we're so far away from the end of the race because you didn't take us with you. So they don't even know where the baton is. You're trying to hand it off, but you didn't bring the kids with you through the race. So I think there's some connecting that needs to happen between the way that things used to be and the way that things are now and not looking at new media as some sort of like dangerous thing, the way that we looked at radio when it first came out, the way we looked at TV when it first came out, the way we looked at blogs, it's just TikTok, and it's super cute and fun, and I suggest you all make one, and also follow Under the Dust News. <laughs> so I think that's it for, for, for me. Uh, news and politics Q&A. We have quite a bit of time, so let me know what you think. I have a microphone. If anybody has questions, I will come around. Hi, I'm gonna be completely honest. I don't watch the news because it just like freaks me out. Yeah, I don't watch it oh. either. It's very upsetting. <laughs> but how do you balance like creating the content you are with also caring for your mental health and like that balance, not going crazy? Um, I don't always do it really good. And when I first started doing the news, I felt such a responsibility to be everything to everyone and to get every story. And I was like, ill, like not well. And my wife was like, I love you so much, but you have to put your phone down. Like you can't, we can't be like this all the time. We can't be like at dinner and you're like, I just have to quick make a TikTok. Like, and I argue that in the beginning I did because this was the ramp up, right? Um, at this point now, I've niched myself into being a place where like you're gonna get six or seven stories and I've really cheerleaded the rest of TikTok as a place to get a little bit more information. It's really hard. Um, I had to stop watching cable news altogether or even having it on in the background because I, like many people, just like have it on in the background. And I found that I was like imitating them. They'll scramble your brains, cable news, okay? Like I love them, they do a great job, but because they tell the same story three to four times in the hour, 
I was, I was like reinforcing their idea of what the story was and then I was telling it and I was like, do I even believe what I just said? Where did I come up with this? Oh, I had the news on in the background all day and they've just reiterated that same point three times. Um, switching off of cable, which is another screen and just doing like articles and other TikToks and whatnot has been really helpful. And when I absolutely feel like I can't take something else in, I will switch to a book, which used to feel like a waste of time to me and maybe not as up to the minute as I should be, but there's so much in books that helps you reflect on the thing that you heard today, right? So I would go to like, like <laughs> I don't like covering Trump and I have to, so I like started reading Bob Woodward's books on Trump, right? Because I like him, he's cool, and we're pals. And I was like, let me go read his book, Peril. Let me go read Rage. And not read it cover to cover, but like kind of like get into it and see what he says about it. See if that can help me reflect at all. Because people who write books have the luxury of reflection. They don't have to publish right now. So they've really put a lot of time and thought and research into it in a way that's just a different way of thinking than published today stuff is. But it is really hard. Um, and there are some things that like, I will tell the audience I have to tap out of. Like when I did the Epstein documents, I got 75,000 new followers, it was huge. People really want me to cover uh, violence against women because nobody covers it well or compassionately. I never do and I covered it then. And now people are like, well, will you talk about this and this and this? And I'm like, I literally can't. I can't because I can't catch that many sads and still bring you like, I also each night try to pick uh, a story that makes me feel hopeful at the end as a kind of payoff. So you'll get like, here's what happened, one, two, three, four, five, and then six is typically like, did you know that women have more autoimmune disease complications because they were prioritizing the data of XY chromosomes and not XX? Now you've heard all the news, you have this thing to think about, and science is gonna do the XX research now, and we're gonna get things that are gonna be better? I'll tune in tomorrow because I feel like I wasn't left to just be like, what, you know? We have a hard time in our regular lives. Just taking in the stuff that happens to us like walking around campus or anywhere else, to take on the news in addition to that as a choice is really hard. And I just don't think that you can or should all the time. Uh, we'll go up here and then down to the front. Hi. Hey. What do you see the, the future of news production looking like if this trend continues of traditional media and new media not working together? So trad media has gotten so expensive. Um, and in some ways, I think them getting really expensive with the fancy equipment and the editing and the big staffs was a sort of gatekeeping for regular people to be able to do it. And now that those agencies aren't as profitable as they want to be or they've sold to billionaires, like there are billionaires that own all the newspapers and they want them to be profitable and like why when you already have a billion dollars. Um, so as we see the sort of decimation of big media, which is I think a huge tragedy and a massive loss, people's appetite is getting a little bit more like amenable to lower quality production. TikTok's really good at that. If my lights are too good, or my audio is too good, or I'm in a studio, they don't like it. They're like, no, 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 you're Hollywood now. You sold out. I hate it. I got a studio for the podcast, and I tried to do one video this week. I was like, this is my new little studio. It's a room in Rochester, like the size of this, right? But, but it's mine, and I'm really excited about it. And they're like, no, get on the floor, right? So I'm going to do that. But I think that as we see like this huge big media with these massive budgets failing or not getting the return that they want, the public has returned to their friends and neighbors for information, for news, the idea of citizen journalism, the idea of small communities. Even the way I plan to ca carry politics this year is not carrying the presidential election, which is usually the big show. We're calling it, and I've trademarked this, so don't steal it. I'm in my down ballot era. And we're gonna, <laughs> merch coming soon. And we're gonna talk about the things that actually matter to remind people that they do have a place in democracy. That democracy is uh, running for student government and learning about it. That's democracy. If you don't wanna vote for the president, that's okay. What if you voted for your class president? That's something, staying in touch a little bit. Democracy is me trying to tell people about my state senator, Samara Brooke, who is gonna be, she was able to get New York State to allow 
Medicaid to pay for doula care to reduce the rate of maternal uh, mortality. Now, if I tell that story, which I will, and I'm like, she did it like this, and here's her game plan, and also she's coming on the podcast to tell you how to do it, somebody in Iowa could be like, why wouldn't we do that? We could do that. Let me follow her plan. I think getting local politics and state politics to understand what other states have that they want can be really powerful to rebuilding trust in politics, um, and that's what I plan to do. But I think the same is true for media. Getting little guys back into talking can help us rebuild our trust in media. Um, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been really informative and you, you totally stole my question. So I'm gonna ask a backup question, um, which is about cancel culture. You kind of mentioned that that like plays a really big role in how people um, choose what to present and, mm -hmm. and how they do it. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about where you see that kind of going and, and how that um, will affect the, the new media as we get more involved with that. Cancel culture is tricky because there's cancel culture and then there's call out culture. And on TikTok, call out got very popular. Um, and so people get that, you know, sort of like satisfaction from having the moral high ground, from calling someone out, from saying they didn't do enough, and from other people jumping in on it. Um, I think it's super dangerous. I also think it can happen when you outgrow a creator. I'm a top of the funnel person. I'm for people who are kind of new to news and politics um, or who just want to kind of know a little bit about what's going on. You will graduate from me, and I'm okay with that. Don't follow me anymore, but don't shit talk me either. Please, God, you have to be nice to me. I cannot handle it, okay? So, like, I'm not tough, all right? So I think sometimes, like, letting people know what the paths are and that annihilation is never a good path um, to either holding a creator accountable or if you outgrow them or if you think they're not doing what they should be. Uh, how bad is it? What happened? Did they reflect on it? I saw people try to cancel Elise Myers this week because she didn't speak about what was going on in the West Bank and her son is having open heart surgery. He's four months old. Elise Myers is busy. Also, Elise Myers is a place of rest and she does funny stuff, okay? We can't expect Elise Myers to be like an international policy scholar and I don't want her to be you know, because there's other people who do that better. So I think it comes down to like establishing the ways that people find power online and clout online, and then setting parameters for if that's acceptable or not. Call out culture had a big time, I would say like 2021-ish. Um, and then some of those creators who were the biggest call out creators got really tired of it. It's hard to be negative like that. It's hard to hold moral like judgment on everyone. And we saw a lot of them kind of snap their carrot. Snap their carrot is something my mom made up, but you guys, you know, you get what I mean. I have a lot of like, you know, old country things <laughs> from my mom. So snap your carrot is like, you can't take it anymore. Um, <laughs> I'll tell, yeah, use that one. It's a good one. That and salty pancakes. That just salted my pancakes. I'm like, ma, what are you even talking about? She's got a million of them. Um, so she, so what were you we talking about? Snap your carrot. If we look at Aunt Karen, the creator Aunt Karen, who was calling out the racist of the day. Well, that was extremely popular and powerful and important in 2020, 2021. At a point, she even got sick of it because she's like, I literally wake up and I'm just looking for the worst people on the internet. And then I have to carry all the comments of other people's rage um, and that's hard. And all her DMs were people just sending her videos of the worst people in the world. And she hated it after a while. Um, so I think it's, it's not healthy for the people who do it, and it's not healthy for the growth of the community. So what I'm trying to tell people now is like, you might outgrow a creator. You'll very well outgrow me, and that's okay. Like, that's great. Sesame Street was good for you when you were a kid. You don't need to shit on Big Bird because now you're in middle school, right? Like, he's still fine. There's still little kids who need him. Um, and I think the same goes for creators. There's ebbs and flows. I've had creators that I'm friends with in real life that I don't follow their content, and I was really embarrassed about it at first to bring up Elise Myers again. I used to follow her content. We're on the same podcast network. I know her very well. I got sick of her. I was like, Elise, I can't listen to one more story, man. You have too many stories. And she's like, that's okay. We're still friends, but I don't follow her content. I think it's about setting expectations and letting people know there are many paths to the way we interact. And maybe I'll come back and be like, you know what, I really need one of those stories about how many tacos you ate on your first date, right? Maybe you'll want to come back, and I see this all the time, no matter how many times people tell me they'll unfollow me, they'll come back when something huge happens in the news and they want that easy explainer. And I'm like, get under there. Come on, come on back. 
Other questions? Yeah. Uh. Hi. Um, Hi. My name's Sophia. I. <laughs> and you're the best audience member. Because oh you God. like eye contact and smile and nod, and that's like very affirming. So oh good. my God, that's <laughs> the best compliment I could ever receive now. I'm, my ego is going to be through the roof now, so thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to recover. Um, so I work uh, at an office on campus uh, that does a lot with sexual violence, dating mm -hmm. violence, stalking, and harassment. And me and my colleague here, Jacob, do a lot of the education and outreach for that. Mm -hmm. And I've really been fascinated by TikTok and would love to utilize it in a better capacity do you have any like tips tricks advice for someone who's starting out and wants to try to connect with gen zers yes so you have to think about what the win is for the audience member not necessarily even what you want to say or what you would think the win is um i told this story at lunch about when roe v wade was overturned i was at vidcon which is a huge creator conference, 70,000 kids come to see their favorite TikTokers and YouTubers. And I had to make the video in the morning. And my video was like, it happens. It's okay. There are levers of power that we can use to protect you. Some of you not, but we're going to keep fighting for you. We're not giving up. Don't give up. A lot of give up on social media. I feel like I'm constantly telling people not to hurt themselves. That is important. Um, and I went out into the, on the, you know, conference floor and got just absolutely swarmed with like, V, what does this mean? Crying, everybody being upset. Um, and then I went back to the hotel and the cute TikTok boys with the hair and the thigh tattoos, <laughs> I don't know who they are, but they're so handsome. <laughs> they were like, uh, I saw your video this morning. I'm like, yeah, what about it? And they're like, a couple questions. I'm like, okay, what's going on? They're like, we think girls are going to be scared of us now. I'm like, should they be? And they're like, no. No, no, no. But we think they're going to be scared of us now because now, like, you know, if anything happens, we think maybe they're going to be scared. I was, like, scared of intimacy with you. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, here's some things you could do. One, you can affirm for them that you're not going to do anything weird or sneaky that could potentially get them pregnant and they won't have options, right? We're not going to do that. We're not going to do anything weird. And they're like, we don't, what do you mean? We don't do that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, I was like, you're going to be a responsible partner. You're going to recognize in your girlfriend right now if she's scared that her feelings are valid, and you're going to listen to those feelings. And then you're going to vote. And you're going to call your congressman, and you're going to use your cute white boy powers to let other men know that what happened today affects them and is not OK. And they were like, uh, yeah, but we just want to know. This probably means like no more hooking up, right? Like Probably not like casual hookups, right? Because the girls are going to be like more worried than they were before. You have to find the win, no matter how much it makes your guts shake, OK? And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's a consequence of what happened today. What was the win for them? Them getting mad at Congress for taking away what they consider to be sexual freedom, choice, uh, youth, all kinds of things, and making girls that they care about scared, whether that's their sisters or their friends or their partners. They did not like that. So for me, I was like, don't let Congress scare your girlfriend. When I talked to my conservative followers and they were like, well, we think this is probably a good thing. I was like, cool, if you don't, if you don't want to be in charge of your family planning and you want Lindsey Graham, who's never, never seen a woman in his life in that way, <laughs> to tell you what you can do with your wife and how many children you can have, then that's fine. I guess you want to give up that power as a man. That's not what I would do, but that's, that's what you're into. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you gave up your power to, to decide how many people are in your family. If your wife can't get help, for something that happened, you know, you have a pregnancy that you can't have or she gets sick. Maybe you even want the kid and you can't, you can't, she gets sick. You gave it up. You said, nah, Lindsey Graham can decide for me. And then they were furious, right? Finding the win, even if it makes you just, your guts shake with like, I wouldn't think that way, but I can get there for you. Yep. Sort of thing, so that there will be some sort of 
maybe not truth, but some sort of common ground that people are getting similar information. Do you have any sort of thoughts on how that might work in TikTok? Yes. So I um, had the pleasure of becoming really good friends with Leslie Stahl, who is the journalist from 60 Minutes. So Leslie Stahl is the coolest. And I was asking her how she got into journalism. And she was saying that when she was young, they would only hire women to be the writers, but you had to hand it off to a male anchor because only men were allowed to deliver the story. And I think that's why we thought that there was such a collective uh, around what the truth was, because the truth filtered through the male anchor who got to decide what stories made it. A lot of the executives were male executives. And so um, that was the echo chamber. It was just sort of like imposed on everyone because there wasn't uh, the integration of other point of views to how that truth shows up, right? So you might have like a story about, uh, I'm trying to, it's like the Detroit thing where they, where the government gave a bunch of money to people to like buy houses. I cannot remember the name of that, but there was a piece of legislation that gave um, people a bunch of money to buy houses in Detroit to try and revitalize Detroit. Well, the story was, a bunch of black folks are gonna come into Detroit and buy houses now, right? That was one of the narratives. But in Ebony Magazine, the narrative was, we have finally been seen, our activism has been rewarded with this grant from the president that is going to allow us to finally participate in home ownership and generational wealth building. So both are true, right? But one was the perspective of what the standard was, and one was the perspective of this unique marginalized voice that would have never made it into the main piece because whoever they handed it to would have been like, that's, so, that's not, I don't know anything about that, right? News is a fast moving thing and sometimes the thing that the editor knows is the one that gets in because they can verify that really quick off the top of their head. They're like, yes, I know that is true. So I think the democratization of what the news is, what the, what the story is, is gonna continue to split, but it's something that we all have to recognize uh, many things are true at once. So that's what I do with my news, and it was something I had to make a conscious decision on, is to say what happened and recognize that like, like with Roe v. Wade being overturned, I could have never known that the boys with the thigh tattoos and the hair, their truth was that this was stealing their youth. I wouldn't have thought about it. I was thinking about what it means to like me and my wife and whatnot. Many things are true. Um, I hope that we can build some bridges between understanding that many things are true and I think part of it is not just constantly creating others. So white men had all the power when it came to the narrative, then it diversified, then it got to a point where they're like, anyone who's a white man can never speak or have an opinion or a leadership role ever again. Well, now you're marginalized them, right? We can't just pick a new group to marginalize because they used to have power or they will again in the future. It's about like everyone still having their place in it and their truth in it and trying to respect that like I don't know what it's like in Detroit. So what they say is true for the thing I say is true. Um, I don't know if that helps, but I do think that it's going to continue to to be this kind of fractured truth because the way that things happen apply differently to everyone. There are a lot of people who think the school book bans are excellent, and there are a lot of people who don't, and both of them are right based on the way that they, their value system is, right? Because it's more about like my opinions as a truth and my beliefs as a truth as opposed to like, what does the research say about book bans? And then, well, who published and funded the research? Are they biased? What was the bias? On? You can never get you know, just like a clean, perfect thing. And then people will say I'm like the Walter Cronkite of TikTok, and I'm like, no. <laughs> this is so nice, but no. But it's the same idea of just saying what happened, you know? Um, hello, I have a question about the cross-platform differences. Mm -hmm. So I know people nowadays still read a lot of news on like YouTube, yeah. Instagram, Facebook. I wonder what's so special about the news on TikTok compared to news on other social media platforms? It is easier. It is easier to make a TikTok than it is to make a YouTube. To make a YouTube, you need to have a certain level of um, professional video ability because YouTube is so uh, just saturated with people who are trying to do that and do it on a really high level. And so, you know, they have their established channels, sort of like a podcast following. You get little cult followings on your YouTube the same way. TikTok, 
because of the scrolling and because of the short form of the videos, you could see, I think you see it's something like 100 videos a minute when you're scrolling TikTok, if you're like in your, in your scroll zone. That's a lot of content. It's a little bit easier. And at a point, it used to be that only the first seven seconds of your video gets seen. I have a really high finish rate. I have like an over 70% finish rate, which is unheard of. Um, but most people, it's just a quick take. It's a lot faster. And I think people liked that. It's also not a place for celebrity culture. And it got rose to prominence during the early pandemic when trust in institutions completely fell. So we were back to like our friends and neighbors and regular people. Like I said, if, if, if people's lights get too good, if their audio gets too good, if they start to film in a studio, your audience can feel betrayed by that because they're like, oh, now you're Hollywood. It's like, no, I just, I've been doing this for four years and I just thought maybe I could sit up and do the news, but I, I recognize that I can't, that's okay. I'll just get back on the floor. But I think it's a little bit of that. And TikTok, great discoverability platform. You don't make a lot of money on it. And I think that actually helps keep people honest because the incentive isn't always to make a ton of money the way that YouTube can be. Um, it's to be heard. Like likes and follows are monetary in a lot of ways. And that's the validating response that people go for over trying to like sell you something. Although TikTok shop now has kind of changed that. But. If you have time for one more question, if anybody has one more question. Y'all had great questions. This is the best school I've spoke at so far. <laughs> Y'all are so nice. <laughs> uh, my question is, with your all your platforms, what are you looking forward to? And then what are some challenges that you foresee in the next like six months or so, other than the election? Yeah. Anything else? So I have an undergraduate degree in theater, which means that I am like an expert at being told that someday all of my dreams will absolutely be ripped away from me. And I, and that everyone has an expiration, okay? Um, and I didn't get TikTok famous until I was in my late 30s. And I know that someday this will end. And so I prepare for that so I don't get my heart broken. And what will I do when this ends? What, what did I gain from all of this time and all of this stuff that we did? So I look forward to doing things like, I just got a speaking agent because I really love just like being with people and like doing workshops and trying to like help them understand and develop their own thing. So I'm like, okay, would I go on to be a professor someday? Would I go on to write a book someday? Would I be a speaker someday? That's the kind of stuff I look forward to. I know I'm probably like four or five years out from that and I'm grateful for that time and I'm gonna protect that time I have. Um, but I think with anything you do, there are peaks and valleys in your career. And sometimes when that valley comes, you just think you'll never get back up to a peak. But like, I've been fired from jobs that I thought were my dream job. And they were like, no, actually you suck at this. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Right. And now I'm on TikTok, like different things. Um, so I look forward to, to protecting what we have with TikTok for the next couple of years, but there will always be something new. And because I am so specifically TikTok, I will never be Instagram, even though I have a big Instagram following. I'm never going to be a YouTuber, a Snapchatter, or whatever, or a Blue Sky, or a Threader, or whatever comes next. I will always be a TikToker. Um, and I'll be really proud of that, and I'll be happy with that. And then someday when I'm like 55 or 60, I thought I might run for Congress, because that's what you do, right? That's a good <laughs> retirement job. <laughs> Because I think that's a really fun way to, again, stay involved and help people find their dreams. But my goal is that I can create enough of a downline of having inspired enough people that they feel they can give it a try and then pass that on. I just got asked to do State of the Union at the White House, but I did it last year. And I already know what that feels like. And I want someone else to feel that way because that made me in some ways with the Democrats, right? So I don't need to go again. What am I gonna, okay, I go again. Now I'm Joe Biden's kid forever, right? Like I know I'll never get out of that but somebody else will have that special chance. Can you tell everybody one more time your brand new podcast and where they can find it? Yes, so you can find me at Under the Desk News on all the social medias. Um, if you do follow me on threads, I will warn you it is my shit posting account. So you get a lot of sass over there, okay? That's a good fun time. If you really wanna know what's going on over here, behind the scenes, it's threads. And I have a new podcast called American Fever Dream, and it seeks to kind of explore exactly what we're going through, just the American dream and a fever dream and how, how we get through it. And we are in our down ballot era, so each week we'll be giving you insight into the most awesome candidates from across the nation that are doing really cool things that we hope people in other states steal. Please join me in thanking V Spear. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. And I You're watching CNET, Center County's Government and Educational Access Network. Give thanks for literacy. Literacy means a life of increased safety, achievements, and community participation. For more than 50 years, Mid-State Literacy Council has empowered thousands of residents with literacy skills, improving their families' lives. Literacy builds our community. Help us celebrate literacy and support Mid-State Literacy Council by volunteering or donating to our Give Thanks for Literacy campaign, www.mid-stateliteracycouncil.org.